Well, hello, free people of the Rocky Mountain region. My name is Brandon, and welcome to this Free State Colorado interview. The mission of Free State Colorado is to promote a culture of liberty, freedom of the individual, and a free market. Today, I'm joined by Hannah Goodman. Hannah is a Colorado native and a rural Colorado rabble rouser. Hannah's efforts to make Northeastern Colorado a freer place have made her a thorn in the side of the Holyoaks town and the Phillips County political establishment. Hannah is also the vice chair of the Colorado Libertarian Party. Well, Hannah, I hope you are well and thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Awesome. Well, great. You've been doing an amazing job as the Libertarian Party vice chair, and I've been really looking forward to talking to you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here and talk with you about all the different topics we're going to cover today. Well, perfect. Well, let's start kind of, Hannah, how did you become a liberty activist? What motivated you to start paying attention to politics and, and getting involved? So I've been a stay at home mom for about a decade now. And initially I started homeschooling my children when I lived in California. I lived in California briefly and we moved back home essentially. So I've been homeschooling and taking care of my kids, just minding my business. I absolutely adore being a housewife. It is the passion of my heart. However, shortly after moving to Colorado, some government decided to start intruding itself into my life. I do not vaccinate my children. And yes, I know everyone's going to say we hope they die. Okay, great. So, because I haven't heard that one before. Here in Colorado, initially, the bill was to enter all unvaccinated children in a county in a database with all of your information exposed circumventing HIPAA, as well as student rights. So this was a big fight and there was a ton of activists that flooded the Capitol that year. I think it was 2018. I took part in those efforts. I never made it to the Capitol but I made sure to call all of my representatives and let them know how I felt, spread the word, help pass things around, email, all of these types of things. So there was people that showed up, but then there was those like me who couldn't because I live so far from the front range that it was just not feasible to travel. So in that time, my grandfather was our county commissioner and I assumed he knew about my stance with my children. He did not. And he was very shocked when I asked him to make phone calls to the gentleman that he helped get elected on my behalf and the behalf of my children. And he took a very authoritarian stance with me and he refused to help me. After that, I said to him, but you're a Republican, you stand for liberty. That's what you've always told me. And he could not actually bridge the gap for me. We ended up getting in a screaming fight and this is where I enter politics. My grandfather said, well, if you can do a better job, then do it, little girl. And I said, hold my hat, cowboy. And I took off and I didn't go to my grandma's house for a while, which for me, a while is like a couple of weeks. We've subsequently since calmed down quite a bit. He also very much lost his self when he found out I joined the Libertarian Party. Well, after my conversation with my grandpa, I, well, I'm very self-educated, first of all. So if there's something I want to know, I'm going to dive into all the books that I can and I'm going to read them. Reading is my passion and I read at a really rapid rate. It's something that is a natural gift that I have. So I called my best friend who is a political science major and I worked with her when she was getting her degree. Uh, she and I have a love of politics. So she told me to go ahead and get started on the nonfiction of Ayn Rand. And I was like, nonfiction? Okay. So I jumped into all the works of Ayn Rand and I started front to back with all the fiction. And then I also discovered the nonfiction counterparts. And I learned objectivism from the ground up. I also used Ayn Rand Institute app, Ayn Rand University, and I've taken a there are a very good long amount of courses through that. 
So as far as objectivism and the philosophy of Ayn Rand, that's really where I come into libertarianism. I said to myself, these are the greatest ideas I've ever been exposed to. Why is there not a political party this way? Like, where is the political party that, oh my God, we're going to have to start our own political party. I said that to my best friend. And we really talked about it for a long time, knowing the struggle, obviously, it is to have a third party. I stumbled upon libertarianism and I said, don't, I know the objectivists are going to come for me, but I said, this is the closest thing I can find to Ayn Rand's philosophy in a political party. And I searched for the first year trying to find out, well, why didn't she like them? And I didn't find it in the first year, but now that I'm the vice chair of the Libertarian Party of Colorado, I figured it out. I know, I know I can see things much clearer now. However, I still think that the Libertarian Party is worth giving a shot. So that is essentially how I fell into the Libertarian Party, as well as the Liberty activism that I do still currently. Oh, that's great. That's an amazing story. Uh, really cool. I, you know, Ayn Rand is definitely one of the most influential libertarian types of philosophers and writers. I think her fiction and her nonfiction have definitely awakened a lot of people, opened their eyes, and she's responsible for a huge percentage of the liberty movement we're facing today. So that's great. I recently read, I finished all her fiction books just probably within the last year or so. And yeah, phenomenal stuff. I mean, for it to come out in the time it did too, you know, all the way from We the Living up until Atlas Shrugged. I mean, that's a huge span of time with so much, so much happening in the world. And she, her voice was is, is, is amazing and it had a huge impact. It's really incredible to think the power one person can have writing books. Yes, absolutely. I call her my mother. So I'm very much uh, fluent in the history of libertarianism as well as the party. And I call Rose Wilder Lane my aunt. And I call Isabel Patterson my grandmother. Because without Isabel Patterson, also the objectivists are going to come for me right now on this, Isabel Patterson created Ayn Rand. If there had been no Isabel Patterson, there would have been no objectivism. Ayn Rand being uh, you know, English as a second language, there's no way she could have read and absorbed all the knowledge that she did through reading. So she was an avid reader, don't get me wrong, and she was very well read on her own. But as far as the history of America, she would have had no real way to really absorb all of that and and be able to cite the works of the founding fathers. Whereas Isabel Patterson was a titan and a powerhouse for knowing that right off the rip. When you read God of the Machine, you can clearly see where that spin came from. And it's like she took that seed and passed it to Ayn Rand and Ayn Rand cultivated it in herself. That's sort of how I see it. And so I think people will be less offended when I say it that way rather than, oh, Isabel Patterson created Ayn Rand. But essentially, without one, you would not have had the other. And Rose Wilder Lane is also another favorite of mine, but she's not what brought me to the liberty movement. And I'm she only just wrote The Discovery of Freedom. And, you know, there's a few other things, but her role was significantly less as far as literary works. And that's where I get my bones from. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, the impact a book can have on a person's life, uh, you know, Oftentimes, I think, you know, what kind of an impact can we have to spread the philosophy of liberty and freedom? You know, one person's efforts can't change the whole world. But, you know, if you can change one person's life, if you can open up one person's eyes and make a difference in their life, then it's all worth it in my mind. It is. And think about Rose Wilder Lane, though she didn't have as huge literary contribution and she didn't necessarily have the impact Ayn Rand did. But without Rose Wilder Lane, a libertarian woman would never have received the first electoral vote. And so her importance can never be understated either, because that is a monumental leap in the history of this nation. And it's very underlooked, in my opinion, which is so sad. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Very fascinating. It's great. If only people read more books, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I and I was horrified to learn that not everybody loves books the way I do when my children were like, I hate reading. 
Oh no. You just broke my heart, child. What did you say to me? <laughs> that's that's too bad. Well, you know, hopefully they'll grow out of it. Find the they just gotta find that one book, that one author that speaks to them. And that could that could be all it takes, you know, to become a lifetime reader. And two of them are very they it's not that they hate reading, they do enjoy it. Uh it's my first and my third who are just not into reading. And, you know, I think maybe ages and my my oldest son who doesn't like to read, it's not to say he's not educating himself through other mediums. You know, YouTube videos, all these kinds of things are instructional. It's just a different medium of instruction. Well, these days, you know, books were the, the sole source of transmission of knowledge in the past. You know, you have podcasts, you have online videos, you know, website articles. There's so much content out there. It's really incredible. And I think that's part of the reason why there's more libertarians now than there's ever been. There's more people who understand or believe in a philosophy of freedom, free markets, and liberty. And that, you know, that does make, give me a lot of hope for the future, a lot of optimism that, you know, that we're going to, we're going to make it. <laughs> I, I think we are, you know, I think we're just on that precipice because People, well, I recently went to a Republican meeting. <laughs> they had no idea who I was and I wasn't going to tell them. Um, they talked about the largest growing voter base in Colorado and the nation is the unaffiliated voter. So you can see clearly that people are very tired of the status quo of the talk, the promise, and nothing happening. You can only do that so often before people are over. It's just a game. It doesn't exist. It's an illusion. So what do we do now? And when I learned that piece of information, I got at the directors as I'm hearing this real time in the LPCO discord. And I'm like, what is our strategy here? This is they're not even being considered here in the Republican Party. I'm assuming they're the same in the Democrat. What are we doing to court this voter? Because the Republicans said, oh, this is such a shame. They had no plan. And they looked at it like, oh, well, oh, well, you just said your party's dying and you don't know why. You told me this is happening. And you're not willing to court their vote? What is, well, I guess now we know why you're dying. I mean, so yeah. Um, and that was a very eye-opening experience for people who have been working with me here in the county on Liberty and showing them that side of their party when we brought an issue to them. And they looked at us like this, we're not touching this issue. And we can get into that issue anytime that you're ready. I'd like to kind of go back a little bit to your talking about the vaccine issue is kind of what activated you and motivated you to get involved in politics. So did you, I mean, what did you think with the whole COVID phenomenon and everything over the last year and the rollout of these vaccines, and now we're facing, you know, ma vaccine mandates and vaccine passports and this and that, how, you know, what, what were your thoughts as this started to become kind of reality? So where I jumped in here in Colorado, of course, we may not recall it now because news cycles being so short, measles was the scare for all of that legislation. And that was nationwide. Uh, California completely lost their vaccine rights exemptions for philo philosophical, religious, medical. They don't have any vaccine exemptions for school age children in California that was taken away during the measles so for them to say that they weren't priming the public with the measles which has a very low death rate in the general public you know when I heard this and I saw this I knew something else is going on because I'm also not stupid and I never trusted my government I don't know anyone that has I don't know anyone that trusts their government so I said to my husband you know this is never going to end this is going to continue legislation is going to continue to be introduced we lost the second round of that in that legislation being introduced the very next uh, cycle so or session and that was i knew we were going to lose it but because i homeschool i'm not part of that so but if my children wanted to play sports or take an art class or things like that 
fortunately they don't take anything through the public school um i would have to be a part of that database and so understanding that the public has been being primed for years and then covid comes and of course i knew where that was going <laughs> that's stupid of course they're going to ask you know well i didn't understand that maybe they were going to ask for vaccine passports i didn't quite know what it would look like but i assumed there would be some sort of verification process and even when i said and i got a hold of the idea of vaccine passports and i started saying that's where it's going to go plenty of people told me i was crazy that's not true but yet here we are and look at New York. So it, it's already currently happening. Why wouldn't it eventually happen, you know, closer to home here in Colorado? And look at our current legislature here in the state. Right. Not too surprising. I mean, it's it's shocking, really. Just this in just the idea of databases. The government created databases of American citizens who have undergone specific medical treatments or been injected with specific drugs. I mean, that's the most un-American thing I can think of. That this government tracking system based on getting your government approved shots your government approved shots you know i mean it's it, it's it's so it's so crazy and it's I'm, I'm surprised there's not and well hopefully now there are more people speaking up more people kind of waking up to to how ridiculous this is and how terrifying it is to the government to mandate medical decisions and force drug injections i mean it's it's slavery is what it is it I'm, is and you know there wouldn't even be a vaccine debate if you got the government out of the way. So for me, my biggest, one of the biggest reasons I don't choose to vaccinate my kids is because I don't trust my government. Why are you protecting manufacturers from liability? How are they ever going to get the feedback to improve this product? Not only that, once the government starts getting involved, that slows technology down. It never helps it. It always slows it down or stops it. You think about the, you know, the introduction of vaccines was their early 20th century, like the 20s or the 30s or something. And you think about the medical advancements since then, my God, thank God, first of all, unless you live in Holyoke and you have no medical care, my grandma could get her broken arm set in like the 50s, but you can't get a broken arm set here now. You have to go to Sterling. Don't get me started on the local healthcare, but you think about it and if vaccine technology progressed at the same rate, they would have gotten control of things like negative side effects they would be i still think there would be some but i know that it would be a lot less you think about heart surgery they go in there with lasers now it used to be they opened you up and were like saw your breastbone open and now for heart stuff they go in with lasers it's less invasive why can't this technology become safer and as a consumer i have the right to say I'm not taking this product because I don't think it's safe enough. And if you can't force me to buy it, though, that's how I feel about it. And if we had the government out of the way, vaccines would be a lot safer. It, they may not even look the way they do now. And people would be more apt to get them like, sure, why not? You know, I get it for everything else. It seems to be fine. I trust the people who are making them, but there is no trust when there is force. And that's my biggest issue. You can't trust somebody who's forcing you and if you're forcing people you can't trust that they've completely converted to your ideology either well that's a great point yeah if, if the market was allowed to operate as it should with like you said with feedback with people deciding consumers deciding what product they're going to get without the government protecting these bad business practices then yeah it would definitely look a lot different i mean i think you're 100 right the biggest detriment to healthcare in our country is the fact that the government is so heavily involved in it storing the market controlling prices deciding who can participate and who cannot who can offer medical care and who cannot and yeah it just makes things uh worse off for everybody ultimately and divides right us at the end of the day it's a way it's a division tactic you know true yeah when the and that's it too you know as the government has gotten bigger and they've gotten their hands in so many different things everything's become a political battle and you know it used to be uh people would say well you know i'm not interested in politics i don't need to get involved in politics well these days you almost i feel like i don't have a choice i feel like i think a lot of people feel that way because politics is involved in everything i do 
and not because I want it to be, but because they got their hands, these, these little political greedy mitts in every little uh, cookie pot they can find across, across the country, you know? Yep. Yep. And it's, it's just a nightmare. And I'm so tired of the vaccine issue. I'm like, I'm so tired of fighting this. This is such an uphill battle but it, I believe it's worth fighting for and I can't go, I'll go down swinging, essentially. I will fight till the last breath in me for what I think is right. And so while it may feel very daunting and overwhelming and I'm tired of the years that I've been doing this, at least I can bring my years of experience on this specific issue and help a lot of people. Just like how the other side, the medical tyrants, they failed in 2018, but they were able to pass it in 2019. You know, it took took some work. It took some time. And on the medical freedom side, it's going to take a little bit of time. You know, we can't win overnight. So, yeah, you know, that's that's great. It's a good, valuable message for everybody out there because politics, it's easy to get burnt out. It's easy to get, want to give up and say, you know, I've had enough. I put in my fair share, but you, would, you just need more people to keep fighting and not give up and, and don't give in. And stand tall, speak loud and and fight until your last breath, like you said. Well, uh, unfortunately, medical freedom is not our only battle we have to fight here in Colorado. You know, Colorado, like so many of the other Western states, are facing this, this breakdown, this division between the urban center and the rural areas, too. I mean, we've seen that this year with the attack on, on beef, the attack on oil and gas, the attack on just animals. Uh, animal husbandry and farming and all of that. So can you give us a little bit of an idea of what, what you're seeing out there? I mean, living in Holyoke out there in Phillips County, you're definitely far enough away from Denver to, to have a different perspective than a lot of people here in the metro area. Yes. Yeah, so interestingly, last year, my Senator Jerry, Sen Senator Jerry Sonnenberg wrote an article and he cited one of our local reporters from Sterling, Jeff Rice, who wrote an article for the Journal Advocate. And according to Jeff Rice and his research, 25 boards and 220 appointments only have 12 appointees hailed from east of I-25. That's right, roughly 5% of appointments are from the eastern third of the state. Wow. So, and I can talk a little bit more. I have a few points here on the entire war, and I'm going to come back to that because these board appointments and being so underrepresented on the boards, that is how these policies come down the pipe that people, even if they may not acknowledge, oh, there's a war, there's not a war. When you only have an underrepresented minority of people on boards regulating things that they actually know about and live, you know, you're going to have ideas that sound perhaps good in practice, but in reality, they're horrible. So, for instance, one of you know one of the most controversial point board appointees, according to Rural America, was Ellen Kessler for the State Board of Veterinary Medicine because veterinary medicine covers yes domestic animals like pets, but she oversees all of the animal husbandry practices, and there is more uh, live you know livestock vets than there are small animal vets here in the state. And she is, the reason she's so controversial to rural America is that she's a vegan activist. She talks about this. This is her platform. I'm a vegan activist. Um, and her attack on 4-H, she said that they were teaching kids essentially that animals' lives do not matter. Not even understanding or even being willing to understand and look at what the 4-H project, project actually does. I go to fair every year. My children are involved in certain things. We don't do animals because I live in town. Although technically, thanks to myself, I can have some livestock here in town, but I just choose to not. We have a lot going on. Anyway, 4-H, when you go to the fair out here, 4-H is the big one of the biggest draws we have. And do you see these kids, when we come in, they hold out their chickens for us to hold. They tell us their names. Do you want to pet my chicken? And my child, we, I had chickens in California. My children grew up with them. They love them. So they're all hands all over. And 
we go to the pigs. Pigs are my second favorite, not because they smell great, but because they're so sentient beings. They have such personality. I love hogs. And if you don't think that the children cry when they sell their animals for slaughter, you would be wrong. Some don't. Some get used to it in a sense and kind of harden that up but most of them do cry they love their animals and a lot of times they don't sell them and they take them and they show them at different fairs throughout the state so to say that it teaches animals animal lives do not matter they actually are as tame as pets so 4-H animals are very tame they're not like cattle out on the range where <laughs> You just don't go over the fence or you can always tell like a bottle fed cow versus, you know, a calf that was raised by its own mother. Um, so there is actually a change in the animals when they're handled all the time. They do tame quite a bit and the children become very connected with them. So that was such a shock to rural Colorado that he would appoint this person over this board that regulates this type of thing. And this is the ill-informed thing she's spewing everywhere. So I can also tell you about, look at Proposition 114, that mandated introduction of gray wolves into the state, right? Voters in the liberal counties of Boulder and Denver voted for the measure with two thirds majorities, while counties ranching communities, the counties with the ranching communities on the Western Slope were against it and voted against it overwhelmingly. So you're having people in cities vote to reintroduce animals that they don't know anything about. They don't understand animal husbandry at all. Not only that, when you live rurally, you know, walking on the edge of town in the evening, you have to be careful. Like people don't understand my town. We only have one stoplight. It has a taxation and a theft sticker on there. But it's the only stoplight in the entire county. The streets are not well lit. In the smaller towns, wild animals come through there. You get coyotes, you know. So imagine a small town on the western slope and or a small farm. Having wolves run through that property is incredibly dangerous to humans. And then you're going to be losing out on animals that you need to sell to, like, feed your family. And yes, there's a huge problem with farming subsidies and that type of thing. But, you know, most of the families that are wealthy farmers have farmed generationally. It's not newer people who are making hand over fist. And so it's just a nightmare. I can't even believe that the cities could vote for what animals are introduced into a rural area. It's just wrong. And then think about the Paws Act, right? Fortunately, there was enough kickback in the Democratic circles that they had to put that on hold, but for how long? How many cycles is it going to be before that one passes? And people don't understand cattle raising aren't going to be able to regulate and tell people how to raise cattle. I'm sorry. I don't generally go to a rocket scientist and help tell him how to design a rocket. I don't go to a news anchor and tell them how to present the news. I don't even tell my bag boy how to bag my groceries because here in Holyoke, we still have that and they take the groceries to your car and my groceries are bagged perfectly. So <laughs> I don't tell anyone how to do their job unless it's a job that I'm involved in and I'm doing and it's just wrong. So more locally in Yuma County, which is just the county south of me on October, August 30th, 13th, 2021, the Supreme Court handed down a small victory for them, narrowly preventing the state from imposing a $625,000 penalty against Yuma cattle, a Yuma County cattle operation, right? Um, and I know this feedlot, the family operated five-star feedlot. Um, what happened was they got super bad rains, the worst they had in 50 years. And something overflowed into the river, the Republican river, river and a bunch of fish were killed and it was just a natural freak accident right well the state came back at them even though they were in compliance 100 percent with state regulations and said they should have prevented and planned for this foreseeable accident what is a foreseeable accident first of all you we got to pull these concepts apart because they're two conflicting ideas it's an oxymoron essentially so thankfully 
the Colorado Supreme Court upheld that and they don't have to pay for those fish that died because they had rain for the first time in 50 years. And if you've been to Yuma County, it's sand hills. It's pretty much desert. Okay. I think it's gorgeous, but it's rough country. It's rough and they don't get a lot of rain. So I, that's something that's very local and close to me. And then we have the Tri-State Generation and Transmission Association closing coal power plants in Colorado and New Mexico. That actually directly affects me here in Phillips County. My power, interestingly enough, is pumped in from New Mexico. And that is scheduled to close next year. Is it, I think it's 2022, but it could be 2023. So when that closes, my power is going, the price of it is going to jack sky high. You've got less coal power plants on the grid. There's nothing that supplements that power. Look at California, you know, yeah, they're the leading in green technology, but how much of the power grid in their multi-state collection are they hogging to replace all the power they stopped producing? So you can't have these technologies quote replace this technology the, the technology doesn't exist and well technically it does but nobody's crazy about it i have a lot to say about nuclear energy <laughs> but it, also with that so i talked about um our economic situation so when they closed that the grand junction sentinel reported that the closure of the craig station coal plant in the far northwest corner of Colorado will kill 253 jobs. The plant's demise almost guarantees closure of the Kola mine, which supplies the plant with coal, ending an additional 219 jobs. And it could also put the Trapper mine out of business, eliminating another few hundred jobs. Now, to understand the economic toll, consider that El Paso County's population is 54 times larger than the population of Moffitt County alone. That means a loss of 500 jobs in Moffitt County would feel like the loss of 27,000 jobs in the Metro Colorado Springs. So what is that going to do to rural America when you start cutting off our economic lifeblood, especially in a place like Moffitt County that doesn't have agriculture as king? The Western Slope is not a huge agricultural producer, not the way that the Eastern Plains are. And I can't even imagine what that would feel. What would that feel like in Colorado Springs to lose 27,000 jobs? That's the economic impact in rural Colorado. And no one is talking about that up on in the Capitol. Nobody's talking about that in Denver. But we're going to die out here if this continues in this trend and all of that is brought in by all these you know quote unquote green sector blah 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 they're putting in through covid funds they're putting in brand new windmills uh in logan county up by fleming they're constructing them now and it's been a nightmare it's been a mess you know it's interesting that there's a train line right there but you know how they're hauling in these windmills they're hauling them in, it's like five semis per one windmill and they're putting in hundreds. And they don't come and go loaded. They come loaded and they leave empty. So tell me about green. You know, when you could bring it in by train, you could pull down old stuff, haul it out by train and use far less semis and less carbon footprint. Not only that, they're notoriously inefficient. They do not contribute much to a power grid, especially, you know, Fleming is cl is closer to Denver than me, but it's only like 30 minutes closer. So it's still, you know, three hours out. Transfer that down the line. And if you know how power works getting transferred down the line, it gets less powerful. They just really don't contribute. A lot of people may think, well, they'll power Sterling, but they don't. Sterling is on the same power grid I am in New Mexico. So they're not actually contributing anything. And in my opinion, they're just a way for different people to funnel money to different projects and make it look, well, we put up these windmills, you know, and I just drive past them and I get really angry when I look at the windmills. Oh yeah, wasted taxpayer dollar. Oh, thanks COVID funds. I need windmills for COVID. Well, that's the name of the game of politics, right? You steal money from somebody to give it to your friends over here. 
I mean, completely and utterly ridiculous. You know, as you were going through all these all these attacks on rural Colorado, I couldn't help but think of Atlas Shrugged and this decivilizing effort that seems to be taking place. You know, whether it's taking away our ability to eat meat and and you know nutrient rich food, to destroying jobs, to reintroducing wild, dangerous animals to rural areas, it's almost like we're getting to that point with society collapsing around us where we're going to be, you know, or people are going to be burning trash out of barrels, oil, old oil barrels to stay warm. You know, that great scene in Atlas Shrugged where, where, you know, everything's just falling apart. And it seems like these authoritarian political policies are really driving that home. And, and, you know, it's a simple answer, right? Just free the market, leave people alone, let us do what we want and uh, let entrepreneurs create opportunities and solve problems for people. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. I can't. I also the whole idea about Polis appointing this vegan, you know, PETA activist as the veterinary board. Um, I mean, he knows what he's doing. The guy's not as much as he acts like an idiot. He's not that much of an idiot. He at least knows what his impact is going to be, and it's definitely a an assault on rural Colorado. I mean, ideally, they want us all eating soy burgers and bugs and driving electric cars if we could. So it's absolutely crazy and it's hard to believe, but yeah, it's, it's something we got to talk about and, and it needs to be a bigger issue. Denver is holding, the Denver Metro is holding the rest of Colorado hostage politically yeah. because there's so many representatives and so many senators that just the Denver people alone can decide what they want to do. And there's not enough representation outside of Denver to change those policies. It's, it's, it's something's got to change there. It does. And I watch our state, uh, sessions very closely. In fact, the only thing I really watch is federal and state politics. I watch them on the floor, though I'm not watching news recaps. I live stream the, the state when it's in session. You can watch them. And I love Jerry Sonnenberg. He's such like a, I'm going to fight you. But you know, we all know it's a losing battle. And a lot of other rural people don't really fight it as hard as Jerry Sonnenberg does. And I'm going to be very sad when his when he's done. Like, we need him because there's no one to replace him right now. And I can say that I'm not a big fan of Ron Broad Pelton, who is my representative. So he, in my opinion, is the establishment Republican. He's nowhere near that fighting spirit. You know, Jerry Sonnenberg, he's a tough old bird. And he's amazing. When you write him, he always gets back to you himself personally. And I wrote him when I was working here in Phillips County. I was asked by my community and represented healthcare workers who were not allowed to represent themselves for fear of losing their jobs from the hospital here and other people who were afraid of speaking out, they came to me and said, we know that you know how to fight this. Would you please represent us? And so I was granted a hearing before the county commissioners. And while I was doing that, I was also writing Rod Pelton, which he never responded. I wrote Jerry Sonnenberg and he said, absolutely, I'm doing everything in my power to fight this. I'm meeting with these people, these people, these people, please hold the line in Phillips County for me. So it was amazing to be able to at least have one politician get back to me who's elected and support that because the lack of support from the commissioners, from the Republican Party was so sad. The response that we got from them, it was it was just so weak. And that's one problem, in my opinion, that Phillips County has. We are not strong like Weld. In fact, we were the last county to get on board with being a sanctuary county for red flag laws, dead last. And I told him this was a brand new board. And so I was actually really excited to present this to them and think, okay, this is a fresh new board. We've got you know, these new guys in here, this can, you know, let's see, let's give them something to fight for and see what they do for it. And they just gave me the same run around. Well, we're, you know, we have the ICC to partner with and we're working on this and we don't want an economic impact like you're saying, but we really can't do anything. And before that meeting, of uh, the two days before that I was in a Republican meeting and Mark Hillman, I believe the former treasurer of the Republican party, who was also in the state assembly, 
my friend and I that was working with me, we went up to him and we told him what we were doing and if the party could help. And he looked at me like I handed him a stinking pile of garbage. He had a lot to say about libertarians to my face because he didn't know who I was. But when I asked him if he would help us fight for that and would the party help convince the commissioners to take a stand, he said, I'm the party cannot help you with that. And I'm like, you just told me Trump, Trump, Trump. Great. You told me, oh, the unaffiliated voters are the ones that are growing and the Republican Party is losing numbers and dying. You don't know why and you have no plan and you sure can't help me with that. But I have to tell you, it was so eye opening for the people that have been working with me on this sanctuary county issue. And I could point to them and say, do you want to know why I'm not a Republican? This is exactly why I am not a Republican. And my grandfather tells me I waste my vote, that, you know, I'm not doing anything and blah, 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 and that the young people need to come back to the Republican Party. And I said, well, Grandpa, do you have an argument that's going to convince me to rejoin? Crickets. There is no plan coming from the Republicans. All they want to do is capitalize on the name Trump in a bad sense. And they want to keep continuing to collect their tax dollars. And if people don't think that they're not in on the whole bamboozling the public and creating division, they're wrong. They are. And they're not doing, they're not coming to save you. They're not coming to save you on this issue. And so that is one of the main reasons I tell people this is why you should join the Libertarian Party. I know because I'm on this board, we are taking a radical stance. We are taking a strong stance and we're trying to get the word out and we're trying to help fight for your freedoms. But instead of registering unaffiliated because you're mad with the Republican Party, why don't you just go ahead and mark libertarian? What do you have to lose? And honestly, I've not met anybody that said they had something to lose and they didn't tell me no. So you may see Phillips County start to grow if I can get enough of people on board with my ideas and showcase what it is that I'm actually trying to do for them. All I want is the government to leave me alone and I want to make sure that gets done. So I'm going to do it myself because when I do it, it's going to be done right and we're all going to be left alone. Okay, so, you know, this is an idea that's now in the environment here in Phillips County. The Republicans aren't going to save you. There may be another option. That's great, Hannah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's a the politics is it's sales, it's marketing. You know, how do you attract people? How do you win people over? How do you create influence in a community to try and make an impact and, and get some things actually changed? And I mean, I think you're doing a great job. You're showing up, you're speaking out and, and being bold. And you know, I think that's a huge draw for the Libertarian Party of Colorado is bold messaging. You know, some for so long, the, I've worked in Republican Party politics. And the biggest frustrating thing for me was a lack of bold messaging. You know, people who didn't want to offend, they want to be, they want to fit in. We can't say that. We can't be too extreme. We're, we're afraid of the, what the media is going to say. We're afraid of what the Democrats are going to say. Well, I'll tell you what, the Democrats aren't afraid of what you're going to say about them. They're going to be as bold as they want. They're going to say and do whatever they want, and they don't care what anybody else says. And until the Republicans learn that lesson, you're always going to be playing second fiddle to the Democrats. And it's a great opportunity. There's a market opening for the Libertarians to come in and say, well, hey, we're fighting. We're fighters, and we're going to stand tall, speak loud. We're going to be bold and let's do some let's fight yes you know and meanwhile the democrats and republicans are you know what i mean the democrats are saying whatever they want the republicans are giving lukewarm messaging and they're dying so let's not continue that trend here you know i don't want this party to die i would like to get elected with a party that represents my principles and my morals and my values, and I want to be proud of it. I could run independent. Absolutely, I could. But why? This is a party, the, every party is just a vehicle for candidates to get elected into office and represent a certain set of values, morals, and ideas. And these ones closely align with me. And so I just believe it's worth 
joining, diving headfirst into and using as a platform to get my bold messaging out because it does fit with all of our ideas. And the whole idea of lukewarm messaging, that is a recipe for death. That is drinking the poison. If you want to die as a party, that is how you do it. I'm not drinking the poison. Amen. Preach it. That's great. So Hannah, say, say the Libertarian Party grows. It becomes a more powerful force in Colorado politics, and it becomes a more powerful force in Phillips County and Holyoke. What would you like to see? What, what would need to be done to make Colorado a, a free state, make Colorado a freer place? What do you think? Um, what are some of the policies or positions, some of the principles that could, that could be enacted in our community to, to make us freer? I definitely think I'm all for economic freedom. That's my passion. I love thinking about how humans act in, in the market. And so, especially for rural Colorado, a lot of our hands are tied for a lot of stupid things. And to make us more free, we're going to have to start repealing all these regulations around what we do out here as far as creating wealth. You know, poverty is the natural state of affairs. How do you create wealth is the main question. And it's not rob your neighbor because that's not actually creating something that's sustainable. When your neighbor runs out of things for you to steal, you're gonna die. So what can you do to create and contribute that's going to sustain you without robbing people and using force against them? And that would be to repeal as many regulations as you can. I know that it's a really unpopular position here in rural Colorado, but you know what? I'm just gonna take it. Where I live, we don't have access to cannabis. It is legal here in Colorado, but half of the counties are are not even allowed to sell it uh, or grow it for themselves. So you think about that and all of the data supports a free society when you look at cannabis. When you deregulate cannabis, violent crimes go down across the board. Crime rates themselves go down across the board. You don't have a lot of problems that you did before. You think about it, when you go get cannabis in a rural community now, you're at a dope house. And guess what they have at dope houses? I could tell you, I'm an addict. I have 16 years. And so I can tell you, you're gonna find methamphetamines there. You're probably gonna find uh, some prostitution. There's gonna be other different things. I know that heroin started getting really big out here since I've been clean, so I can't really speak to that, but I do know that it exists. So when you go buy your cannabis or your marijuana, you now have other options on the table. You have sex trafficking going on. Is that of age sex trafficking or is that underage? And you know what? I can tell you a lot of it is underage and that's frightening. Um, you now could potentially become addicted to methamphetamines. You could become potentially addicted to heroin. And the lifestyles that those bring um, are going to weigh you down. That's a huge ec epidemic in rural Colorado is the amount of drug use out here. Why wouldn't you want to take that down? And drug use and drug dependence, drug addiction, those all go down when you legalize marijuana. Now, for an economic impact out here, just by legalizing marijuana trade, you would open yourself up, not that I'm for taxes, because believe me, I think all taxation is theft, but I live in the real world also, and it's being taxed at, I think, a minimum of 25%. And the only place here in the northeastern corner that sells it is Sedgwick, the town, not the county. And I think their tax rate is 27 or 29%. I don't remember. I don't shop there very often. So... <clears throat> They generate huge amounts of income just through taxing that product alone. We struggle out here economically. My city council, for instance, they wanted a million dollar firehouse. Well, they slept on the grants that were being issued. Um, they don't have any funding for it. They've had to take this down to cut the budget in half to $500,000. Meanwhile, when they were trying to get that passed, a huge amount of residents, including my grandfather, good for him, came to the city council meeting and said, the streets here in Holyoke are terrible. What are you guys going to do about the streets here? Like, the crowns are massive. All you do is seal coat. That's it. That's all you do. What the hell? And essentially, the city council doesn't have the budget to fix it. 
and I attend every city council meeting. <clears throat> I can tell you I've watched them raise things like fees on lots for a trailer park. And so they're trying to generate revenue through taxes. Our workers here for the city get paid pretty much minimum wage, just a tiny bit above. Our cops, we are down three, and they start at twelve seventy-five an hour. No wonder we can't attract cops. They also just voted to hire a new cop because of our crime rates. They never once talked about how do you lower crime? You could do that by opening the sales and trade of marijuana in town and in this county. You wanna see that go down? You wanna see crimes go down and you wanna make it safer for your police officers to be in this community? We had a police shooting of a suspect last Christmas Eve. And I don't know for sure whether or not the person open fired on the police or if the police shot them unarmed. They shot the kid in, in Logan County unarmed. So it wouldn't surprise me either way, but I would be, I would say it's safe to say I'm not living in a terribly safe community anymore, right? You would think so. Most people would leave their car keys in their car and their doors unlocked out here. That's actually starting to not be a thing anymore. And that's so sad. You think about the breakdown of the culture of our communities going from these safe, beautiful towns and cities to shitholes, basically. Holyoke used to be the Emerald City to me. I, when I would come here and I would visit my family and we as kids would walk the streets and play in the park, it was one of the most beautiful places I had ever been. And I was so excited to move back here because Sterling is much bigger and it's not as pretty and it's definitely gone downhill in my opinion since when i lived there but coming and being in holyoke i felt safe i loved it here and i say to myself as i walk the streets now how can we foster that community pride you know i've offered several solutions with just one product now community pride isn't going to come from the cannabis sales okay but when you're a free people you're a more harmonious people and you're more respectful. And I believe that is where liberty fosters a healthy culture and a healthy community. So when you give people their freedom, you'd be surprised to know that people are actually good. If you give them the chance to be good, they will be. When you treat them like criminals and you regulate the crap out of their life, they tend to not act like free men anymore. They tend to act like slaves. So in order to make rural Colorado more free, we're going to have to deregulate a lot of things and we're going to have to change our opinion on some things as well. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's great. Yeah. I think the cannabis market is something that rural Colorado embraced. It would definitely reduce crime, create jobs and create a whole new economic boom in many parts of the state, you know, instead of everybody having to drive to to Denver or Aurora or someplace and give the, those bloated cities their tax money or go to some dealer who, as you said, is involved in potentially other nefarious activities. And then you get involved, you know, somebody who's just looking for a little bit of cannabis to ease some pain, then they end up getting connected with somebody who's selling hard drugs and involved in other criminal enterprises. Yeah, that's a, it's a bad recipe for sure. So Oh, and if you uh, think yeah, go ahead. about the in economic impact also, where I live, I have to drive to go get things. Walmart is an hour away. So if we incentivize people to come into Phillips County to here in Holyoke to come get cannabis, they're going to do their other shopping here. We have a grocery store. It's fantastic. I love my grocery store. So, and other businesses would also open up and flourish and people would be more inclined to just drive to Holyoke to do their regular need procurement. It would solve so many things just so simply. Yeah, it's a great start for sure. So you said you're running for office. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So I was a candidate in 2020 for city council, which I did not win. And I am currently running for the seat that's going to be opening in 2022. Well, actually there's three seats opening 
and I'm not sure about the incumbents, but it looks like we're going to have six to eight people running in this next election. And normally we can't get people to run at all. So I'm uh, going to be seeking a position on the city council. And for me, just like my vice chair position here with the Libertarian Party, it's just a stepping stone. I intend to go very far with the political career. My children are almost grown. And so I can really dedicate myself to a career. And I want to build a really strong campaign resume. And I believe in working for everything that I have. Handouts are not something I take or like taking. So for me, working from the bottom to the top is my goal. And if I could just get in on the city council and start building this solid resume underneath me and also make people really happy to have elected me because I will represent them and their voice, even if I don't agree with what they want me to do, I will still do it because I believe so strongly in being a voice for the people that elected you. That is the most important thing. And the people who elected me to the vice chair will definitely tell you, I generally look to people and I'm very open to feedback. If you, I may not agree with you and sometimes I may not actually take that stand here in the party, but I will always listen to you and I will do my best to try and find a compromise also. So these are some of my really strong traits I have for running for office and I intend to make it to the Colorado General Assembly just like my great grandfather did. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's, so you have a history, a family history. You said your, your grandfather was a county commissioner, your great grandfather was in the state assembly. Is that, did I get that right? Yes, and actually, many of my grandfathers were county commissioners. When I was in the hearing at the end, they asked me, oh, Goodman, because I'm married and I didn't marry anyone in this county because we'd be related. <laughs> I'm very good on that. So my name is unusual to them. And they said, oh, are, are you from Akron? And I looked to them and I said, well, uh, no, as a matter of fact, I can point to five of my great grandfathers on that wall behind you. So Herman Poe was the first county commissioner. And uh, I th I'm pretty sure unless it was Martin, which would be my grandpa Poe's mother's family. Um, I know that he, Martin was in 1914. And I think Herman was either just before him or just after him. I'm not sure. So um, yes, my roots go very strong here. I'm sixth generation um in this county and it's something i'm very proud of well yeah especially in this day and age when half the people in colorado aren't even from here you know people who are multi-generational coloradans is, is very unique and that's awesome really happy to hear that i really hope that it benefits the libertarian movement because when you're in rural colorado when you speak to one of us you're essentially speaking to all of us you know word travels fast Gossip is entertainment. Not only that, you're talking to the relative of the relative of the relative. For instance, the girl who won the city council seat happens to be a cousin. And the vacancy that just happened and I was not voted for. <laughs> I stir way too many pots to be elected by that council. She is my grandmother's nephew's wife's brother's wife. <laughs> so that's when you're here that is how it is especially in rural Colorado I don't know that it's like that very much on the front range but anywhere in rural Colorado when you talk to one of us you're talking to all of us and word's going to get around and that's one thing I think that is such a benefit to spreading libertarianism in our rural communities yeah that's awesome that's a I never really thought of it that way but yeah it's like if you could you just get a couple people and then everybody we're travels fast. If, if it's a good idea, a lot of people will, will jump on that bandwagon and, and, and maybe join the cause. So that's pretty cool. Yes, awesome. it's very exciting. And my so my great grandfather was elected. He, he and my great grandmother, they lived on the original homestead that was awarded an award um in 2013 it's like a centennial farm or something like that they he was elected to the colorado general assembly and it's interesting because some of my family is republican and the others are democrat and so and the the pose never switched to republicanism still to this day they tow a really hardcore democratic line and 
they are the strongest connection I have to this county. Not necessarily the area, but this county is, I'm, my mom was a Poe, my grandpa Poe, his dad was the one who was elected and my grandpa Poe worked for him in when he was in office and my grandma was involved in that. And so my grandma is able to tell me a ton of stories about his time in the Colorado General Assembly. And he was actually the vice chair of the, what do you call it? The council, the legislative council, Colorado Assembly. He was the vice chair for it several terms. So I think that's really interesting. My grandpa Poe has served on a lot of boards and he's run for election himself into public office. He's never made public office, but he has been on um, the Colorado Corn Growers uh, Board and he was president for four years and he was secretary for one year. He was on the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. I'm not sure of his positions there. And he also sold sea corn for a very long time. So, and he picked up that sea cordon business from his father. Well, yeah, I hope that uh, the, the legacy continues and that you end up in the state legislature and beyond. I mean, that's incredible. Continuing that family tradition of activism, of rabble rousing and speaking out and being an important part of the community. I mean, that's incredible. It's very inspirational, Hannah. I uh, really appreciate you talking to me. And I hope that, you know, you kind of, I hope this kind of gives people an idea of, hey, get involved, start showing up. There's a lot you can do. The sky's the limit. There's, there's nothing stopping the spread of Liberty. If enough people just get involved. Yeah, definitely. You just got to find that Howard Rourke in yourself and you just got to go for it. You just got to hold on to it, not let it go and just fight for it. And so that's, I'm definitely, I, I have my Howard Rourke in me. <laughs> Well, is there any place that uh, people can follow your political activity online or, or anywhere? How can people reach out to you if they're interested in talking further or maybe supporting your campaign? So you can, for as far as the party, you can reach out to me at vice chair at lpcolorado.org. And it goes right to my phone for the most part. I'm connected to my phone until I lose it. But I generally always respond to anyone, even if they're not in the party who writes me on that email. So another place that you can find me is my vice chair page on Facebook. It's Hannah Goodman LP. It's at Hannah Goodman LP. So you'll find me as the vice chair there. I'm a year out or thereabouts with the city council, and I haven't currently got a page up for that yet, but you can also get at me. Let's see, do I have another page? I think all my pages are Libertarian Party related, but if you go ahead and get a hold of me at the vice chair at Colorado LP about my campaign, I can direct you to other emails I have I need to set up. <laughs> I'll get set up right away so that I can start corresponding about my upcoming campaign. And yes, uh, I'm open for donations, even though I'm not fully up and running yet. So definitely feel free to let me know you want to give me some money. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much for the conversation. It was a lot of fun. It was great to get a glimpse of, of rural Colorado and what's going on out there and uh, continue the great work in the Libertarian Party. We're, we're all lucky to have you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Well, take care, Hannah. Thanks.